Welcome to Chattanooga Valley Presbyterian Church and glad to have you here worshiping with us this day. Before we begin our, our worship, let me give, go over, over a few announcements. This afternoon, uh, Chattanooga Valley Youth will be, Chattanooga Valley Presbyterian Youth will be having an outside Christmas party at the Dewitt's house. And if you have any questions about that, you see Laura Dewitt. And then this, this evening at uh, 5 and 6.15, 5 p.m., a mask required service and 6.15, a mask recommended service. We will have lessons and carol service uh, here at the church. And also at 5 p.m., there will be live stream on Facebook of that service. I do want to make a couple of announcements about vol uh, volunteers and, and needs in, the, in our community. Volunteer needed here, volunteers needed here for help in the, our church sanctuary to help disinfect the church between our weekly services. Uh, about 15 minutes time is required, so it's not a very big commitment. If you have any questions about that, uh, contact Gareth Jones. And there's also a clothing need for Chattanooga Valley Middle School for students in need this winter. Such things as coats, shoes, underwear, and socks. Um, there will be a donation uh, drop-off uh, box in the back that can be uh, where any any donations can be placed. That should be in the foyer uh, in the next couple for the next couple of weeks. At this time, let us begin our worship. I'd like to call the Dewitts up for our Advent reading. second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it, it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and wife by covenant. Did he not make them with a portion of the spirit in the union? And what was the one God seeking godly offspring? So guard yourself in the in your spirit and let none of your you be faithful faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in sp your spirit and do not be faithless. Thank you. And Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And, she, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was great, greatly troubled at the, at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give, him, uh, give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am still a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born. Uh, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, whom was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father, we thank you for 
all that you've given us. We thank you for the season of Advent as we prepare for the coming of Christ, both um, as we look back to what Christ has done uh, at his first Advent, at his first coming, uh, and we look forward to the um, second coming. Uh, we will come in glory. Uh, we pray that we would respond like Mary and um, as your servants, and I pray that you would again prepare our hearts as we go into worship. Um, remind us of the season uh, as we spend this week in preparation. In Christ's name, amen. of God and the heirs of the promise of salvation. <clears throat> Let us rise before the Lord our God as we come before him to worship him in spirit and in truth. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 31 verse 1 through 5. Hear now the words of your God. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily, be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit thy spirit. <clears throat> redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's sing, as with gladness, men of old. distinct privileges we have as Christians is prayer. 
um, as I once heard a pastor says, what separates the Christian God from all other gods is that our God to hear our prayers. And that's certainly true, beloved. Um, we don't pray simply because it's in our liturgy, as a matter of tradition. That's not why the pastoral prayer is here. That's not why the Lord's prayer is here. The reason why we pray is because this is central to our faith. We are a praying people. God has called us to pray. And so we do it out of obedience to him, but also out of joy in knowing that when we pray to our Lord, he hears us and he answers those prayers in accordance with his will. And so I encourage you as God's people to be fervent in prayer, to pray often to the Lord. And so now, as I enter into a time of pastoral prayer, I encourage you where you are at to please pray to God and ask him uh, to hear you, to answer your prayers, and to pray faithfully for those around us. So let us go in now to our Lord in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, indeed, you are infinite, eternal, and changeable in your being, full of wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. We thank you for being our holy and wonderful and majestic God who lives right now to make intercession for us who not only hears our prayers, but delights in answering them. And we thank you that now we have the privilege to come before you in worship, but not only worship, also privately, and bring our request before you. We thank you for the glories that we see in Christ and the promises that we can pray back to you in faith. Oh Lord, that is wonderful, and we as your people revel in that. Lord, today we bring the request of our body before you as we think about those that are about to have surgery, Anna Mar, um, about to have a heart procedure. Of course, Barb Michael and tomorrow, I think, are about to go into sh uh, shoulder surgery. Father, we pray for them and ask that you might be these wonderful dear saints and protect them as they go um, into surgery, that, we, that it might be uh, profitable, that it might fix the problems that are before them, and that they might come out healthier than they went in. Lord, we also pray for those who are shut in, who are watching now, unable to come. Father, I pray that this service might be a blessing to them, that even though they are not here with us physically, that they can enjoy fellowship with the body nonetheless. And that even now you are with them, encouraging their hearts to all that they see on the television. Lord, we pray for those that are still recovering from illness as we think of Dana Monahan, And we continue to pray for the Monahan family and his continued healing. And even now, Lord, that his immune system, though compromised, we ask that you might protect him from illness. We pray for Grady Collins and his knee and continued wisdom for the doctors in giving him the proper course of treatment that can bring about his healing. We pray for the Hansen family, and I know they've had a few uh, positive cases of COVID. And Father, indeed, we pray for the quick healing there and that no one else uh, gets um, the illness. And we continue to pray, Lord, that you might sustain them during this two-week period. I know that they will miss being with the body, but help us to surround them during this time with prayer and to help in any way that we can. Lord, we continue to pray for those that are quarantining for various reasons. Father, be with them spiritually. Continue to grow them even though they are away from the body. Continue to strengthen them in your most holy and perfect love. Father, we pray for our area as we think specifically of teachers and students and schools as they grapple with uh, various schedules from COVID-related uh, concerns. Father, again, please protect the teachers and the students from contracting the disease. I know many are frustrated by the um, 
the schedules and we're remembering who goes in the first of the week, who, who goes in the second part of the week. But I pray even through this, Lord, your hand of mercy might be upon those that they might um, teach effectively and learn effectively. Lord, especially be with the children. I know that these are difficult times, but may you keep them in your perfect will and increase their joys during this period as well. And for parents who have to adjust um, their hours working or just schedules to accommodate, give them the necessary patience that's needed to accomplish the task of the season. Lord, we pray for those that are out of work and COVID has took, taken away their job or rendered them um, unable to have consistent work. Lord, help us as the church to continue to provide for their needs. Give us the wisdom to know who to give to and to seek out those that are in dire need. Lord, we pray for our country and the world as we um, struggle underneath the weight of the pandemic. Father, help us to exercise wisdom. Help us to know um, where to go and what to do. Give us that wisdom that we be able to protect others as well. But Lord, also guard our hearts from fear. Help the church to be the church in which we pursue worship and the sacraments for your honor and for your glory. And now, O oh Lord, give our nation's uh, leaders wisdom as they work through the final stages of relief package for those that desperately need it. Give them wisdom in knowing who to give the vaccine for COVID to. Give them wisdom in knowing how to shepherd us through this very difficult season. And now, O oh Lord, teach us to pray as you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Psalter reading from Psalm 104, the context of that psalm is, uh, it's like the psalmist has uh, got up from the day and he's walked out and he sees the mountains and he sees the cattle on the hills and he sees the valleys and the growth and he sees how the cattle are fed. He sees how we are also nourished from all that is uh, the Lord has provided for us through the, through the vegetation. He sees the stars at night and the moon as it rises, and he gives, gives praise to the Lord, for he is mighty indeed. Let us re read responsively Psalm 104, verses 24 to 35. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open up your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him. For I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand and sing. No worries. Let's stand.
Please, if you will, take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 11. We've been doing our Advent series on the concept of the Jesse tree, and Isaiah chapter 11 talks about that. And last week, we looked at the Savior that brings hope to the world. By the way, if you notice our Jesse tree off to my left, your right, highly recommend you go and look at um, the tree and the ornaments that are on it. On it, it tells the story of creation, uh, the fall, and redemption, and just a, a neat way of talking about Christ um, and remembering him during the Advent season. And uh, as I mentioned last week, we looked at Christ, who is our hope, and we talked about how in verse number one of Isaiah, it talks about the shoot that comes from the stump of Jesse, and that is a symbol of our hope. The hope in Christ, this hope that is near, that is found in the gospel that we can draw from. And that even though things might be um, what we would describe as hopeless, um, Christ is seen in the midst of this hopelessness to bring hope to the world. And this hope is near, but at the same time, this hope is yet to come far off in the new heavens and in the new earth. Well, today we're going to look at how Christ, or the Savior that brings wisdom to the world, primarily in verse number two, but really at different points in the passage as well. So with that said, let's read this passage and then dive into our teaching uh, this morning. Hear now the word of the Lord. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall lie down, shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze young, their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be filled of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word that will be preached unto you. Amen and amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time of teaching and instruction where your people can be encouraged from your word. But at the same time, we can receive the wisdom that we need to live rightly in the world. That at the same time, we might draw upon the richness of our faith to sustain us in these times that are barren and woe. Father, prepare the hearts of your people today through the power of your spirit and through the fellowship around your word. Already we've received a blessing from the singing and the scriptures, the reading of your word in and of itself, how glorious it is. And bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, in the early 1990s, the world was introduced to a bit of technology that we were told would change us forever. And this technology promised to traverse the barriers of language. This technology uh, promised to connect us faster. This technology promised um, to expose us to cultures that were before inaccessible. Not only that, we would have access to the world's libraries, a plenty. Knowledge will be at our fingertips in nanoseconds. Sure enough, it did happen. And we're experiencing it today, and it's called the internet. 
Now, most of you have used the internet and you've been exposed to all of this information. But even though the internet has given us more information that we know what to do with, the one thing the internet didn't do for us is make us wiser, amen? Um, in fact, the exact opposite. The internet gave us all of this wonderful information, but it didn't make us wiser as a people. Now, why is that? Well, the first thing you realize is that information on its own actually makes us kind of prideful, right? People who have a bunch of information, they walk around believing that they have the world on a string. And so one of the downsides of having the internet is that we become fools in the sense that we're filled with pride believing that just because we know more, we're better than others. Or because we know more, we can figure everything out ourselves. The second reason, or I, at least I think, that the internet has made us fools is that we've become poor stewards of information. How many of us stay on our phone for hours on end looking at a bunch of things that have no material impact on our lives? Hey, listen, I love cute bunnies uh, just as much as the other guy. But seriously, sitting down for half an hour looking at cute bunnies doing cute things? Is that really necessary? Or watching people fall down and hurt themselves? Or whatever it is that we spend hours doing on the internet? Like, these things have no practical value in our lives. Like, we're exposed to all of these things, but they have no value to us. It, it's like having Netflix where you have, like, 30,000 shows and you only watch, like, two of them, but you spend an hour just trying to figure out what you're going to watch, right? Well, that's the Internet. It's made us poor stewards of information. And what ends up happening? We, we end up in what... Um, Adults Huxley called the brave new world where we have so much information that we don't know what to do with it. And it actually ends up making us foolish because we end up pursuing information that we don't need and have no practical value to our lives. But the third reason why the internet and having access to all this information has made us foolish is in the sense that we have become, like C.S. Lewis said, despisers of the past, chronological snobbery, in which we lay aside the wisdom of the past. We don't look to the old ways anymore, the tried and true methods that have sustained us over the years. We've cast that aside now for the new trendy life hack that we can uh, come in contact with. Now look, it's not that knowledge is unimportant. As fact, as one theologian said, knowledge is incredibly important. It's just not wisdom in and of itself because wisdom encompasses more than knowledge. In fact, I would say that wisdom actually has three parts. The first is obviously knowledge. You and I have to know the facts. You and I need to be exposed to truth, and we have to be able to understand that truth. But the second aspect of wisdom is that not only do we need to be exposed to truth, but we need to have discernment about what that truth is and why is it important. You know, think of all the things that we do on a daily basis that we just do, but we don't understand the significance of it. Recently, I came across uh, uh, a story on the Internet where there was a guy that didn't take a bath for 60 years. Now, you could only imagine how this guy looked. I mean, he was completely disfigured. He had dirt caked up on his skin, and it completely changed his complexion. And I don't even want to think about the smell, right? But it was awful. Now, here's a guy where, I guess, I mean, he, he discerned that taking baths are good for him, but he just didn't do it. He lacked the discernment to understand why it was important to take a bath. Now, that's... That's trivial, but it's true even in our lives. How many things do we do that we don't discern how important it is for us? For instance, the Bible talks about the washing of the water of the word, reading the word of God. It's like a cleansing bath for the soul. 
And there's some of us that neglect to bathe ourselves with this word on a daily basis so our, clo- so our souls can be cleansed and we could be in a right place in terms of our understanding of who God is. But the third aspect of wisdom is the ability to act on truth. Now, one of the things about our congregation and about the PC in general is we're filled with people who are highly educated. Almost everybody inside here has some kind of formal education or higher degree education. So we don't lack for education in this building. But one thing we do lack is the ability to actually put all of our knowledge to practice. If you were to ask me the great, um, the great need for the church today is we need the wisdom to be able to act on the knowledge that we have. Hey, all of us know that it's good to witness and share our faith, but we lack the wisdom to know how to do that well and the ability to put it in place. Now, why do I mention all of these things? Knowledge, discernment, the ability to put in place all of these things, because this is what Isaiah is talking about In the future king, if you notice Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, he's talking about this future king who will come. And this future king that will come is going to be characterized by wisdom. Notice verse number 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. That has the idea of he he knows, like he has knowledge. He understands what needs to be done, but he also discerns what needs to be done, and he has the ability to do it. The spirit of counsel and might, the word of God says. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is speaking of Jesus. Now ask yourself the question, why did Isaiah start with wisdom? Why didn't he say that that this king that will come will have power? That this king will come in majesty or strength? Why didn't he focus on that? Because even in Isaiah's day, he's telling the people of Israel that the reason why we're in the state we're in now is because we have leaders who are unwise, who act foolishly. The people of Israel remember Rehoboam, who instead of trusting the wisdom of the wise men that were around him, he trusted his friends. They know about Ahaz. Instead of listening to the wisdom of God, he's trusting the wisdom of his friends. Israel was in the spot that they're in in Isaiah chapter 11 because they had a history of foolish kings that have left their country in a mess. And we in America today can say amen, right? I mean, you know, we can kind of empathize a little bit about what's going on because we too lack wise leadership. In fact, we crave wise leadership. All of us do. Well, Isaiah is telling them that there's a king that will come and his ministry will be categorized by wise living. Not only that, not only will he be wise, but he has the ability to give wisdom to his people. That's why he came. Incidentally, that's why when you get to um, the New Testament in John chapter 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the what? Word. The logos. He was the one who came uh, that embodied wisdom. And because he's the Logos, because he's the chief arbiter of wisdom, he's able to give wisdom to his people. That's what Isaiah is saying here, that the future messianic king, he will come with wisdom and understanding and counsel and might. And this person that's full of wisdom will give wisdom to us, his people. Now, I don't know about you, but I need wisdom. In fact, every Monday, if you receive a Monday report uh, from Marsha, by the way, continue to pray for Marsha. She's doing well, by the way. Um, Spoke to her uh, yesterday. We were texting back and forth. But if you ever get a Monday report from Marsha under my name for for, um, prayer requests, the very first thing there is always wisdom. And why do I do that? Because, look, I, I realize how desperately in need I am of wisdom. And I hope you recognize that today. We have a lot of educated people in our congregation. And that's good. Don't hear me disparaging education. But what we need as a people is wisdom. Because I am confident that this week I will come into contact with a set of circumstances that's going to require profound wisdom that I currently do not have at this moment. 
And so what does the Bible tell us about wisdom? How, how does the Bible describe how Christ gives us wisdom? Well, here's what I want you to notice. The same way the Bible describes how Christ, our Lord, gets wisdom, it's the same way how the Bible describes how we get wisdom. And so notice, them, notice this from this passage. Look at verse number two. The first way in which wisdom comes to God's people is wisdom comes by means of the Holy Spirit. Notice with me in verse number two. It says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now, what does that mean that the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him? Well, it's meant to communicate that someone is acting in a supernatural way. It means a supernatural ministry of the spirit that comes upon them. But more than that, it's emphasizing the fact that this person is acting beyond a way a normal human should act. And so one of the things that characterizes the Christ, uh, godly wisdom is that we act in a way that is not common. It's very uncommon. It's beyond us. Now, one of the most clearest examples of this, and probably the most famous one in all the Bible, is Solomon. Most of us remember the story of Solomon. You know, Solomon is this young guy that God puts in place, and, and he prays for wisdom. Does he not? He prays and asks God for wisdom. And one of the first decisions uh, Solomon has to make is these two women come before Solomon, and they give him a story. And they said, look, both of us had children. One of them died, and only one of our children are left. And they're both saying that that child belongs to them. Now, look, if I was in that same position, you know what I would not do? I would not call for a sword and say, let me see the baby, and I'm going to cut the baby in half. That's not what I would do. But that's what Solomon did. And why did Solomon do that? Why did he have the wisdom to do that? Because it came from the Lord. And the moment they brought that baby and he says, look, I'm going to split this baby in half and give you half and give the other person half, immediately the real mother said, no, no, don't do that to my baby. I would rather this woman have my baby than for my baby to get cut in half. And when Solomon saw her anguish, when Solomon saw her yearning for her child, in that moment he knew by the power of the Holy Spirit that this child belonged to the woman. Because no mother would allow their child to be harmed in that way. And what does the Bible tell us? The Bible says that everyone stood in awe of the king because they recognized that the wisdom of God was with him to do justice. Notice that the Bible didn't say everyone was in awe in Solomon because he figured out what to do. Because that's not what happened. The reason why they were in awe of Solomon because they understood that Solomon was acting in a way beyond him. Solomon was making a decision beyond just the assimilation of facts. He was applying godly wisdom and intuition to a situation that can only come from the power of the Holy Spirit. And beloved, that's you and I. Here are a few things I want us to think about and apply to that situation as we think about Solomon. The first is this. We should pray for wisdom because we are often faced with decisions beyond our natural abilities to discern. You know, as a pastor, there are so many things I am confronted with on a weekly basis. And many of you are like this as well, where you just have no idea what to do. <laughs> you just have no idea what to do. Oh, I understand this, I understand this, but I don't understand what to do here. The Bible says, should we pull out our hair? Some of us don't have hair to pull out, but should we? Right? No. Does the Bible say worry about it? No. No, the Bible says we should pray and ask God for wisdom and beg God for wisdom. Beg God to give us the ability to make the right decision. In the book of James, chapter 1, he says, look, if any man lack wisdom, what should he do? Go in the library and check out a book? Is that what the text says? Does the text says, if any man lack wisdom, let him sit down and worry about it, and eventually God will work it out? Of course not. The Bible says, if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it to all men liberally, and upbraided not. 
are you asking for wisdom? Are you begging God for wisdom on a regular basis? The second thing is that in every situation, we should pray for the wise course of action to manifest itself. And by the way, that's different from praying that your vision of what should happen is right. See, the one thing with Solomon that always impressed me is that when, when Solomon did that, nobody questioned Solomon. Like there wasn't somebody in, somebody, there wasn't somebody in the court that raised their hand and said, wait a minute, how do you know that's the right thing to do? No, it was made plain to everyone. Everyone saw it. Everyone says, oh, of course that's right. Right? Because the mother would cry out for her, ch her child, the right mother. And so Solomon made the right decision. So often we pray that we're right, that what we want to happen, it um, actually happens. But in the story of Solomon, we should be, pr uh, like the story of Solomon, we should be praying that the right course of action manifests itself so that it is plain to everyone and we might follow it. That's the teaching of Scripture. But notice the third thing. The third thing that I want you to know from this Solomon experience is that the Holy Spirit gives wisdom to the simple. You know, I think sometimes we forget that Solomon wasn't always wise. We think that Solomon was always wise, but that's not the teaching of Scripture. The teaching of Scripture is that Solomon wasn't always wise, that at one point in his life he was a fool. But he was a fool that went before the Lord and asked the Lord to make him wise. In one of my favorite Proverbs, um, it mentions that children will have more wisdom than their teachers. It doesn't say that children will know more than their teachers. But it says that if we trust in the living God and we pursue after the living God, it's possible for someone with less knowledge to have more wisdom than the most learned. Why is that? Because wisdom comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why. And that's why God's people should consistently pray and ask God for wisdom. So not only do we see that wisdom comes as a result of the Holy Spirit, of asking God to give us, to make us wise so that we can act wisely in the world, but wisdom comes as a result of our love for the Lord. Notice with me at the end of verse number two. It says this, that the, the future messianic king will have the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, what does that mean, the knowledge and the fear of the Lord? Now, there are many ways to interpret that. Some people say it actually means the fear of the Lord, fearing the Lord, like Israel on Mount Sinai. When they saw the thunder of the clouds, they cowered in fear of the Lord. Others said, no, it's, it's rever reverential awe before the Lord, that we are so struck by who God is and what God does that we pursue after him. Now, both of those are plausible, but I think in this context, the knowledge of the fear of the Lord is describing the heart, the heart that seeks after God because this is a heart that loves the Lord. That's what it means, that our Messiah the future messianic king. He will have knowledge because he loves the Lord and pursues after him. And as he loves and pursues after the Lord, he becomes wise. And the same thing is true for us as God's people. Recently, I read an article in World Magazine. By the way, does, does, who all, does anybody have World Magazine? Do you, who all subscribes? I highly recommend that you do. It's a wonderful publication. And, and World Magazine, every year, gives out its Daniel of the year. And they normally give it out to a man who um, exhibits uh, the qualities of Daniel. And this year's Daniel of the, of the year is civil rights leader John Perkins. And in the article, and, and by the way, I don't think you need to have World Magazine to get the article. You can look it up online. I highly recommend you read it. Uh, John Perkins is an extraordinary man. I think he embodies this whole concept of how the more we love the Lord, the wiser we get. Uh, John Perkins, at age seven months, lost his mother. And um, soon after that, his father left him in the care of his aunts. And 
And in the providence of God, God's goodness toward him, God gave him the wisdom not to carry the bitterness and frustration of that loss. And as you read the story, it's incredibly tragic of the way his father treated him even when he was there. His brother died unjustly at the hands of racist police officers who shot him dead for not um, ordering, uh, obeying an order quickly enough. He was beaten near to death by police officers who were filled with hate against him and others in the black civil rights movement. And yet Perkins, in the midst of this, resolved not to hate anyone. God gave him the wisdom not to do that. Even though Perkins never made it past third grade, God gave him the wisdom to start a church, a thriving church, by the way, church that still exists, a church, a Christian family center, which, by the way, still exists, a Christian community development association, which still exists, and to run his own foundation. With only a third grade education, Perkins has 16 honorary doctorates, doctorates from colleges such as Belhaven University, Christian colleges such as Belhaven University, Covenant College, our beloved Covenant College, and you can see right out as you walk out of the sanctuary, from Geneva College, and from Wheaton College. Many believe that um, outside of MLK, he's the most well-known and influential African-American leader. And when he was interviewed and asked, how is it possible for him to accomplish this only on a third grade education, Perkins simply said, because in 1957, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and committed my life to fearing the Lord and serving him. In 1957, everything changed for Perkins. And he started on a life of loving and serving the Lord. And at every step of his life, the Lord gave him the wisdom to forgive his enemies, to love those who persecuted him, to start a foundation to help the needy, to start a church so people can worship it. Over and over in his life, we see God giving Perkins the wisdom to accomplish his will among his people. And we who love and know the, uh, know the Lord should pray for the same thing and look for the Lord to work in us the same way. John Perkins is an example of how the wisdom of the Lord continues to confound the world. Even now, I ask myself the question, why would God send his son in the manner that he did? Think about it. As a baby, in a manger. Why, why that helpless? Why didn't God send Jesus Christ as Thor or Iron Man? Why didn't he? Like some hero. Why did God entrust the propagation of the gospel message to mostly uneducated fishermen? Why did God tell his people to rest one day out of the week? And I mean actually rest. Put away our phones, don't watch any television, just sit down and rest. What's the wisdom in that? Doesn't the world tell us work seven days and we'll be more productive? But God says, no, rest. Rest. Why would God instruct us to use simple elements like water, bread, and wine that if we partake in faith, convey grace? Why does God do things like that? This just seems foolish. Well, Paul plainly tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world. Even things are not to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom of God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's why he does the things that he does. 
That's why the Lord's wisdom continually confounds this world. Because it's not the wisdom of this world. But yet through it, he conveys grace. That's the point of verse 6 through 9. Look, look at how confounding this imagery is. That predator and prey will lie down with each other. That a little child who lacks knowledge and wisdom will lead them and play freely about them. Notice in verse number 9, it talks about the earth shall be filled with all the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. All of this seems just unbelievable. All of this seems actually foolish. But yet scripture says this is what the Lord will do. Because it's manifesting the wisdom of the Lord. And so, beloved, I pray that through the foolishness of coming to church, at least what the world will think is foolish, that we give up our time to come and be with other people, that we would call each other brothers and sisters, that we will partake of elements, that we'll talk about a Jesse tree, that we'll give our money. What? What are they giving you back? Wait a minute, you just give your money for the work of the ministry? That's foolish. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's through each and every one of those acts, God is saying that he is building up his people and conferring grace. And as you do these things, you are being strengthened in the wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. Don't think it's foolish. Press on. Press on. Let's go before our Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace and your mercy as seen in your word. That so much of what we do to the world is strange. So much of what we do to the world is foolish. And yet, Lord, it's through these things that if we partake and do in faith, there's grace. Help us, Lord, to lean in to these things. Help us to pursue your wisdom with gusto, but more importantly, help us to glorify you in doing it. Lord, we don't do these things out of mere tradition. We do it because we know that you have constructed every single aspect of our faith to be a grace and a blessing to us. And so help us to continue to do them and likewise share them with a world who desperately needs them. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing What Wondrous Love Is This. We stand with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we now have the distinct privilege of coming before our Lord and participating in an exercise of faith. As I mentioned just a little bit ago, how, how can bread and juice, wine, convey grace? To our understanding, we, we can't fathom that. And yet, according to the testimony of Scripture, if we partake of these things in faith, believing that our Lord is here, that he is among us, 
that he's actively working, that through the practice of these things in humble obedience to him, we do receive grace. Why not partake? Why not avail ourselves of it? Beloved, we have the glorious privilege of coming before the Lord of glory. Let us do it. Do it with all that we have. You read now, I'll read now the Lord's Supper as found in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 30. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, whoever therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of our Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment to, on himself. These are the words of institution, beloved. These are called, this is called the Lord's Supper, not the Supper of CVPC. It was instituted by our Lord so that we might commune with him. So that we might be reminded of the gospel and what our Savior Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. This is also instituted that we may see his goodness toward his people. In that he has left behind sensible signs for us to partake and sustain our souls and watch in hope of his return. But this also is a reminder of our union with Christ and with one another in faith. We have gathered here together as one people. And so that's why we partake of it as one body. And so now let us prepare our hearts and minds to receive it. If you are in a state of unrepentance, repent. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. If you're holding malice in your heart towards another brother and sister in Christ, repent so that you might come and partake of the supper. Beloved, this is a meal for our refreshment. And so I pray now that we are refreshed by it. Let's go to our Lord again in prayer. Father, as we are about to partake of these simple elements, may the power that they convey as we take it in faith resonate in our hearts and minds. Bless us now, your people, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Elders, please come.
that the Lord Jesus Christ on the same night he was betrayed took bread. And after giving, giving thanks, he took it and broke it and gave it to his disciples as I, ministering in his name, give unto you and says, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, eat now and commune with the Lord of glory. In the same manner, he also took the cup, having given thanks as has been done in his name. He gave it to his disciples and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shared for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Likewise, please partake of the cup and commune with your Lord. of God, let us pray. Father, how good you are to us that even now as we've come in, you have filled us. You have filled us to the brim with the power of your spirit. You've given us life sustaining power. Thank you for your goodness toward us. May we as your people be ever grateful for the simple signs and seal exercised in faith. Bless us, your people, now, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand now and sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
experience the gospel today through the wisdom of our Lord, let us go out singing the grand praises of our Lord to all the earth. Receive now the Lord's benediction. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Christ, Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life so that all the peoples will say, Amen. Our Lord is faithful. Praise the Lord. If you...